Come One, Come All to Twisted Metal Month, a brand new yearly tradition for under 10 hours where we chart the rise and fall of one of Sony's longest dormant series. Each year we are going to take a look at four games that relate to the series in some way. This year we'll cover the birth of Twisted Metal all the way through the fourth entry, one week at a time. Since this series at its core is about a killer clown in an ice cream truck, and since Twisted Metals 2 through 4 all released on Halloween of their respective release years, October seemed like a better month than any to do this. Welcome to the festivities. <laughs> Twisted Metal was one of Sony's most recognizable series in the late 90s and early 2000s as its style mixed heavy metal and edgy gameplay with dark undertones. There were a lot of these games released, especially on the PlayStation 1. Its hard-hitting vehicular combat was an instant hit with players, especially those who wanted to play with their friends. The mysterious and macabre Tournament of Mayhem kept players coming back for more. But Twisted Metal wasn't always a given. Behind the scenes, the story of Twisted Metal is about last chances for some and new beginnings for others in an infant game studio. In this video, we are going to take a look at how the game came to be, where the idea came from, and how all the moving parts came together to make the first entry happen. And an under 10 hours video wouldn't be complete without taking a look back at the game and how it's aged. Welcome to Twisted Metal. Every piece of art has its creator, and probably the most notable face associated with Twisted Metal is David Jaffe. Jaffe was looking down the barrel of a gun in the 90s. He was, and still is, a pretty strong personality who was considered especially hard to work with in the early days of his career. After working his way up from beta tester at Sony ImageSoft that was originally supposed to help pay the bills while he waited for Hollywood to call, he pissed off many developers as he went with his my way or the highway attitude. Sony gave him one last chance to prove he could work nicely with others, telling him there was a group of developers emerging in Utah that could use his help making a game. This was going to be his last chance before Sony cut him loose, so he had to make it count. In Utah, the graphics company Evans & Sutherland was trying to expand from their military and commercial roots and move into other industries. Sony contracted Evans & Sutherland to help them make games going forward. Jaffe flew out to Utah with game designer Mike Giam and Sony Santa Monica's Alan Becker to see what the simulation company had to show them. Jaffe was blown away, saying that once he stepped inside the simulator of a cockpit and flew around in a virtual landscape, he knew the technology was going to be game-changing. The question became, however, what game were they going to make out of it? After returning to Earth from Cloud9, the executives who attended the trip found themselves in a jam. Literally. While sitting in traffic on LA's 405 freeway, the idea suddenly struck them. What if they gave players machine guns and rocket launchers to blow away all the other cars in their path? Twisted Metal, or Battle Cars as it was called by Jaffe in its infancy, was born. Following the epiphany, the idea was pitched to the developers in Utah. They really didn't like the violent ideas, so they spun the idea into a working prototype of a pizza delivery simulator. At the time, that sounded really cool, and it would have been such a disaster because how many times can you sequel a pizza delivery game? I don't remember how we somehow talked them out of the pizza delivery game. I wasn't, I, I'm not very articulate now, and I certainly was less articulate then, and it may have simply been me on a phone call going, are you out of your mind? Sony declined the family-friendly idea and decided to move forward with their car combat angle. Multiple developers left Evans & Sutherland in order to form Single Track, a brand new game studio who would be working on Twisted Metal, as well as a flight-based combat game called Warhawk. Sony forwarded the company $2 million to get the projects off the ground. The two games were developed in close proximity to each other and shared the same code base to start off with. So with Jaffe heading a project as his last chance, and Single Track as a new company trying to prove its worth, Twisted Metal was created with passion and excitement. Throughout development, Jaffe viewed Twisted Metal as a fighting game in vehicles, which to a certain point I kind of see. You can strategically combo your opponents by blasting them with a freeze rocket and then wailing on them while they're frozen. However, this isn't exactly a one-to-one -one comparison to Mortal Kombat on wheels, a metaphor Jaffe liked to use a lot back then. 
So when focus testing began and hardcore fighting game fans were brought into play and give feedback, they nothing less than shat all over it, leading to Jaffe calling a spade a spade and calling it a career. We had uh, this focus test with these hardcore gamers that came in and uh, they just tore the game apart. This was towards the end of it. We were about to put it into marketing, get money from marketing to advertise it. And they played it and it was the whole night they were making fun of it. Yeah, the description of it was it's a fighting game in cars. And so the focus, that, the focus test was comprised of hardcore fighting game gamers. And they just didn't really get you know, how this was a fighting game in cars. I said, I'm gonna start looking for a new job tomorrow because they're gonna fire me because this is a disaster. But when the game was released in November of 1995, people weren't dumping on it anymore. Oh no, critics were giving it good review scores for the most part, with Electronic Gaming Monthly, or EGM for short, awarding it Game of the Year. I was stunned because somebody told me, oh, you guys got Game of the Year. And I'm like, what are you, you, know, what are you talking about, right? And then it turns out, and I won't mention the magazine because I don't think legally we can, uh, but we ended up getting Game of the Year from the most prestigious game magazine that was out at the time, and I was just, it was amazing that it all actually worked. I mean, this was the first big game I had ever done. It was the first game these guys in Utah had ever made. Um, and we ended up with a game that a lot of people really, really loved to the point that we were getting these major awards. And so it all worked out. I have no clue how. Maybe we all just got really lucky. I don't know, but it was, it was cool. It was very, very cool. Jaffe's career was saved and single track was put on the map, much to the delight of Sony's wallets. By the end of 1996, the game had sold a million copies and generated $28 million in revenue for Sony. Those numbers seem small by today's standards, but with the game only costing about $850,000 to make, I'd say that's a win. If I took $85 and turned it to $2,700, I wouldn't be complaining about it. But now let's turn our attention to the game itself. Twisted Metal is a competition put on by the godlike man known as Calypso. Calypso is a creepy guy. His wiry red hair matching his melted off face that looks like Nick Cage in Face Off after his face is swapped. Every year he puts on this tournament, pitting drivers against one another in a battle to the death and granting the driver left standing one wish of their choosing, even things deemed impossible. This year's tournament takes place in the distant future of 2005, during the fictional 10th anniversary of Twisted Metal. The game takes place across six different levels that take place in Los Angeles. The first arena is deliberately designed to be small in order to let players get a feel for the combat and control before moving on. The controls are definitely a bit odd as they were mapped to the genre that didn't really exist in a mainstream way before its release. In a way, Twisted Metal uses tank controls with up on the D-pad being accelerate and down being reverse with left and right moving the car in respective directions. However, you also have the option to use square to accelerate and circle to reverse. Triangle allows you to use turbo and X as handbrake and allows tighter turns. You shuffle through weapons using the front shoulder buttons with R2 firing your machine gun and L2 firing your projectiles and special attacks. Before playing one, I didn't realize just how many types of weapons there were in this first release. While there were plenty of series staples like the fire rockets, homing missiles, and power shots, there are plenty of others that only appear in this game or are changed down the road like oil slicks, tire spikes, and temporary landmines. This means that there are a lot of ways to attack your opponents and strategize ways to combo. The method of repairing your vehicle is pretty different in this game as well, and it's something I could take or leave. In order to fix your vehicle when it's running low on health, you need to make your way to an electrical pad. There are many of these scattered around the maps, and after you use them, they have a considerable cooldown time, making it difficult to exploit without some serious strategizing. They are marked on the map as flashing white X's, which seems simple enough, but the map itself doesn't do many favors for the player. It only shows the relative location of other drivers and repair pads, and it does not show obstacles or walls at all. So there are times when a repair pad looks like it's next to you, but it's another street over. Eventually though, I just learned the layouts of the maps and just memorized where the pads were, making it much easier to find them. Instead of relying on the map to give me a general idea of where they were, I knew their exact locations. As you win and progress through the tournament, more and more opponents are added to the fight. By the time you get to Cyberbia, you're battling eight other vehicles. It gets outright chaotic, and this is where I constantly got a game over on my first few playthroughs. At first this game is difficult to control because it doesn't really handle like anything else at the time, or now really. 
but once it clicks you'll be whipping around and destroying things like it's nothing. In my opinion, there isn't a bad level among the different arenas, but that said, they are very primitive as that's all that was possible at the time. The freeway free-for-all is a bit too much like a circular racetrack as you'll be traveling around it while other arenas are more or less like a bowl or a square. It lends itself far less to the car combat genre than it would a standard racing game. You'll still retain the free movement, but because of the layout, you'll just be driving around and around the track looking for other drivers. My personal favorite level is the rooftop level with the destructible centerpiece that opens up to a new area with weapons and a healing station. And jumping from a secret hallway across a wide gap and landing on a rooftop on the other side was so much fun. But to me, one of the biggest draws of Twisted Metal for me has always been the characters and the vehicles. In the first Twisted Metal, there are 12 vehicles to choose from. Each of the vehicles are unique in stats and shape, as well as what special attack they use. These stats are broken down into four categories, special attack power, speed, handling, and armor. The game does an excellent job of balancing the vehicle so that no one vehicle is overpowered. However, depending on your playstyle and strategy, there is a good chance you'll find a car you're unbeatable with. So if you end up playing, give yourself time to experiment and get comfortable with the selection of vehicles. But what is even more interesting to me are the characters behind the wheel. Each of them have their own reasons to be competing in the tournament. Some are in it for themselves. The ghostly driver Scott Campbell, the ghostly driver of Spectre who shares the same name with the co-director of the game, wishes to be brought back to life. Other drivers are in it for the sake of other people. Angela Fortin, the driver of the Doom Buggy Pit Viper, is hired by the citizens of Los Angeles to kill Calypso and end the contest once and for all. Others are more bizarre. Needles Kane, the killer clown and driver of Sweet Tooth, and the mascot of the series as represented in PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale, is competing to get his best friend back, only it turns out his best friend is a paper bag. But upon taking to the rooftops after your final test, facing Minion, the winner of the previous year's contest, the game ends with scrolling text explaining what happens. It feels like something is missing. That's because there is. Originally, the game was going to feature live-action cutscenes for every winner, but late into development, they were cut after some more of the religious higher-ups took issue with them. According to Jaffe, they had no issues with the violence, but they didn't approve of the women in bikinis that surrounded Calypso on his throne of car parts. So every scene was scrapped and wouldn't reappear until Twisted Metal Head-On Extra Twisted Edition for PS2 as part of bonus content on the disc. Looking at them now, they're all pretty laughable, Sure, there are women in bikinis without any real speaking lines, a pretty crappy normal thing from the time, unfortunately, but they're little more than props doing nothing but stand there, really. The point is, it wasn't any more risque or crazy than anything else at the time. To me, though, it fits the Calypso brand. Like, he's an all-powerful being, but he still feels the need to look cool by surrounding himself with women. But when you get past that, these cutscenes are really goofy and funny. They are B-movie scenes at best, and I mean that in a good way. It's so fun watching these ridiculous movies, especially after hearing how they were made. But while Twisted Metal 1 feels simple today, its impact on PlayStation cannot be denied. I mean, it was included on the PlayStation Classic, a sign of quality and care. In all seriousness, while the game might not set your world on fire now, the most important reason you would go back and play would be if it's still fun. And fun it is. Hey Calypso, it's under 10 hours again. I know you haven't responded in the last five years that I've sent a submission, but this is the year that I'm gonna convince you to let me into the Twisted Metal competition by showing you how I've turned my 2015 Toyota Corolla into the perfect machine of death. This red stripe gives me 15 extra horsepower just by being here. Uh, isn't that Liko the Lotaz joke? Whose channel is this? No need for fancy rims here. Just pop these hubcaps off throw them at your enemies. The back seat is hella spacious. For your friends with weapons to sit in the back? No, this is where my dog sits. These tires are unpoppable. Ain't no nail gonna affect these babies. You literally have a nail in your tire right now. Are you Of course, there are still some things I need to fix after my last fight, like this cracked passenger mirror, broken from a stray shot. I thought a neighborhood kid pranked you by doing that. You're not here to ask questions. All right, Calypso, now that you've seen the goods, I think it's safe to say I'll be seeing you in the next turn. 
So what are you going to wish for when you win the tournament? Probably a new car. This one's kind of a piece of crap. Wait, are you still f Welcome back to Twisted Metal. After the surprise smash success of Twisted Metal 1, Sony naturally greenlit a sequel. Jaffe, now out of the danger zone and single track with a strong title under their belt, wanted to pull out all the stops in the second game, and they had big ideas, with a wish list a mile long. At the top of the list was better control over the vehicles. To do this, the idea for using hover cars was strongly considered, allowing the vehicles to turn on a center point when stopped. While the new direction never made it past the drawing board, Pieces of the concept are still represented in the final release. In Twisted Metal 2, the cars, while still sporting four wheels for the most part, can rotate on a center axis when not moving, allowing you to change directions more easily than before. It's a massive quality of life improvement in my opinion. Sony allotted the team 16 months to make the sequel in large part because of the first game's success. Twisted Metal 2 is a direct sequel to Twisted Metal 1, taking place one year after the events of the first game. Calypso is added again with his tournament, but now that LA is reduced to rubble, he needs to move the event. Why not make it a world tour? So now our competitors are globetrotting from the fields of Holland to the streets of Hong Kong. The scope of this game feels much bigger than the first because of how varied and interactive the stages are. Each location features destructible elements, and according to Scott Campbell, the co-director of the game, the idea to make more interactive elements came after they made the Eiffel Tower in the Paris level explode. Once they showed it coming down to a member of the French press, he was angry and offended. So instead of dialing it back, the team looked at more ways to push the envelope. So now almost every level has hidden pathways covered by destroyable objects on the map. When the Eiffel Tower comes down, the fragments of the tower connect to rooftops and add new areas to explore above the streets. The windmills in Holland all collapse under enough firepower. Antarctica is a stressful map to play on because as cars fight on top of the ice, it gives way and collapses, costing the players and opponents lots of damage, in some cases enough to destroy your ride. The gameplay also feels very refined and streamlined compared to the first. The available pickups have been trimmed down from 11 to 8, which I personally think is a good thing. I found oil slicks and spikes in the first game to be pretty useless, so I didn't miss them here. The biggest quality of life improvement to the power-ups is that they are all marked with unique icons as opposed to bubbles with text on them like in the first game. But one addition that adds a whole new level of strategy and brings the game closer to the fighting game with vehicles moniker the team kept repeating during the first game's development is the D-pad combos or advanced attacks as they're called in the manual. At any moment you can smash a combo of buttons and launch an attack like napalm or freeze rockets. I'll admit I was skeptical at first. But now that I'm used to it, it's way harder to go back to Twisted Metal 1. The Freeze Rockets alone became an invaluable part of my arsenal, and I'd recommend learning as many of these combos as you can if you go back and play. Especially because the AI is smart enough to use them on you. Especially Mr. Slam with his wombo combo of freezing you and then curb stomping you with his special move. The AI in this game feels like it holds grudges. You hit someone once and you're dead to them, something they'll hunt you down to make sure you're aware of. Once again, there are 12 vehicles to choose from, featuring some familiar faces as well as some new blood due to a few drivers from the first game meeting their demise. Multiple of these first-time contestants became series staples like Axel, the man locked into a monstrous set of wheels by his father, Amanda Watts who drives an F1 car named Twister after her special move, and Shadow, a hearse that returns in later games with different drivers. By default, there is one important driver missing from the list, Sweet Tooth. As one of my favorite drivers to play as, he's the series mascot after all, I was really disappointed he's not in the initial list or even permanently unlockable. Instead you need to enter the code up L1 triangle right on the character select screen to add him to the list temporarily. And if you do select him, you can't continue because there are no passwords associated with the character. Getting a game over with him means starting from square one, so you better be pretty freaking good to beat the game in one shot. But outside of our boy Needles, the other characters follow the same rules as the first game, with each one having unique passwords to continue where you left off. All the characters are chasing the same dream as before, to win the ultimate prize, a wish granted by Calypso. 
the art style and endgame cinematics were totally overhauled for the second game's release. Instead of actors in the character select screen, the driver avatars are drawn, and the cutscenes you unlock when you beat the tournament are all simply animated, comic book style scenes. In my opinion, this was a good step because it allowed the creative vision to come across more. While I do think the original game's slash cinematics have their own merit with their tongue-in-cheek, low-budget appeal, the storylines would never have been transferred from paper to screen without the shift in style. Campy and compressed live-action footage would never capture the gravity of Axel's finale when he tears his arms free of his rubber prison and stands up to his father. And while the lost cutscenes from the first game do a better job of depicting the backhandedness of Calypso's wish-granting, his evil nature is on full display here. Like when Bruce Cochran, the driver of Thumper, wishes to be the king of the world, it's granted. But Calypso turns around and essentially wipes out the entire planet, making Cochran the king of both everything and nothing. He's completely alone in his kingdom. Also, seeing Calypso stretch and pull the face of Ken Masters when he says he wants to have the world know his face is grotesque and makes me deeply uncomfortable. All of the improvements in development time led to Twisted Metal 2 being the best-selling game in the series, selling 1.74 million copies in the United States alone, with critical reception much higher across the board, despite the graphics once again becoming a polarizing aspect of the game. EGM continued to favor the series, rating the sequel as the runner-up for the game of the year at the time of its release, as well as putting it in the rankings of the top games of all time. According to Jaffe, it was the best game in the series with the best gameplay of all the games. His philosophy of games is, the second game of most series is the best because the teams that work on them can refine a sequel to fit more in line with the original vision, which only comes from experience. Twisted Metal 2 was also accompanied by the most coveted piece of Twisted Metal memorabilia thus far. Is it an action figure? A limited print of a cover? No, it's a comic book. Only 100 were made for promotional purposes, leading to a giveaway of 50 copies with the remaining 50 being given to random fans who wrote to Sony and requested copies. It gives backstory of Calypso's life and all of the twisted events that led him to becoming the leader of the competition. You can read the whole thing on the Twisted Metal wiki, and if you're interested in that crisp lore, you gotta check it out. It even tells the story of how Calypso became a dad and how his daughter wound up entering the contest to find him. It's very of its time, it's very dark, and it has a lot of illustrations of New York City getting destroyed that wouldn't exactly get made today, if you catch my drift. Despite the success of Twisted Metal 2, Single Track was getting burned out working under Sony's pressures. Scott Campbell said the team's family lives were suffering, their financial situation wasn't good enough to sustain, and all they were really left with was a reputation for making good car combat games. This led to Single Track handing the Twisted Metal rights over to Sony, where it would go on to be developed by an internal team, 989 Studios. Meanwhile, Single Track was bought out by GT Interactive, and the remaining members of the team went on to develop a new car combat game, Rogue Trip Vacation 2012 a game we will be looking at in a future Twisted Metal month. David Jaffe was said to be a consultant for the third Twisted Metal game, but he said he had moved on to other projects that had his attention, meaning he had very little, if anything, to do with the third entry. Needless to say, he doesn't view Twisted Metal 3 very fondly. The golden era of Twisted Metal ended almost as quickly as it began. Just when the series began to find its footing, a brand new team took the series in a brand new direction that we will take a look at in the next episode. While the third and fourth entries, both developed by 989 Studios, have their fans, the difference between the first two games and the second two games is drastic, so I hope you enjoyed it while it lasted. It's all downhill from here, depending on who you ask. Twisted Metal 3, here we are, a series without its creator. The third entry in the Twisted Metal series was 989 Studios' first attempt at making a TM game after GT Interactive bought single track and left the rights with Sony. Initially, David Jaffe was supposed to be coming back to direct, but in reality, he had moved on to the next stage of his career and was only mentioned in the credits under special thanks. So the soul of the series, the developers who created the game with passion, and Jaffe, literally pouring parts of his being into creating characters like Needles Kane, were all gone. Some people would call that a recipe for disaster, and while I would normally agree, I wanted to give Twisted Metal 3 a true chance to make an impression. And what does it do? It makes the loading bar feel progress in the wrong direction. Okay, let's look past that. 
But don't forget it, because this weird error is a sign of things to come. When it was announced that 989 Studios would be taking over, some fans weren't happy. One fan site, the Twisted Metal Alliance, allegedly protested the selection of the company according to the Twisted Metal 3 fandom page. However, I couldn't find any hard evidence that actually supported this, but it's still fun to believe. But why was 989 Studios chosen in the first place if it was causing this much hubbub? While working as a publishing studio for Sony under the name Sony Interactive Studios America, this company that would later become 989 did have previous work making games as well. They worked on the games 2 Extreme, Blasto, and a bunch of licensed sports games. In terms of vehicular focused games, they worked on Championship Auto Racing Team's World Series, or CART World Series for short. But most importantly, the team developed Rallycross, an off-road rally car racing game that was met with serious praise for realism in graphics and replayability. But after they tweaked the handling to be tighter, the team implemented it into Twisted Metal. When Twisted Metal 3 released, the reviews were all over the place. IGN gave it a 4 out of 10, EGM, the publication that lionized the first two entries, gave it a 5.3. But GamePro gave it 4.5 stars out of 5, and Game Informer gave it an 8.7 out of 10. The reason I mention review scores in a very granular level here is to set a precedent. This game was incredibly polarizing. At best, it was a worthy new entry. At worst, it was the worst game in the series. In my humble opinion, this game isn't as bad as its biggest detractors say it is, but it's also not as deserving of the high praises from some critics. For a game to be a 4 out of 10, in my eyes, something has to be fundamentally wrong with the game, like a game-breaking bug or a save wipe issue, or mechanics that simply fail to function. Twisted Metal 3 has none of these issues, but that also doesn't mean it's flawless. In fact, I really dislike the engine from Rallycross and the way it's implemented into TM3. At a distance, it might be hard to tell the difference, but get a controller in your hands and you feel it immediately. Your car can no longer rotate when it's stopped, and turning requires momentum either forward or backward. Additionally, the cars have inconsistent traction where the wheels are grippy moving forward, but lining up a shot while reversing means you'll be slipping and sliding all over the place. And don't get me started on how horrendous the camera is. My biggest frustration with the gameplay is that all these cars hate being upright. They flip over if the wind blows the wrong way. Both your vehicle and the AI's vehicles are upside down almost as much as they're upright. They're like my dog. But the gameplay isn't all bad. The best part of Twisted Metal 2 returns. The combo attacks where you can tap specific D-pad combos to shoot freeze rockets and rear firing rockets. Just a couple of examples of the many different weapons you can use. And they work as well as you expect, if not a bit better than before. I've seen the sentiment that the arenas outright suck, and I disagree. I think they're mostly serviceable and they add new environmental puzzle elements where you need to shoot switches to open secret areas. A couple of the areas are pretty derivative from other games or are just outright boring, like the familiar feeling London area, or the totally empty Washington DC. Like the games before it, Twisted Metal 3 uses a password system and unfortunately Sweet Tooth is once again locked behind a password and can't permanently be added to the roster. But that also let me try out new contestants who appear for the first time. Augur was a lot of fun to use. This construction vehicle feels like a tank, and understandably so. It basically is one. The drill on the front is used as a special weapon to hook enemies and spin them to death. Club Kid, the Mini Cooper driving rave life DJ I definitely wouldn't get along with, is zippy and fun despite flipping over more than any other car I drove. His special attack is really good. You drop down a cyclone that sucks up enemies and then explodes. While they're trapped, you can wail on them and maximize damage. I liked it a lot, but that's really where my compliments about the game end. Easily the worst part of this game is enemy regeneration. After killing all the opponents on specific levels before the round ends, enemies you already killed come back for some unknown reason. It's not particularly fun because on one hand it feels like padding, and on the other it's frustrating because they could have just shown you enemies you haven't fought on that level. Why make you fight the same enemies twice? But where Twisted Metal 3 really falls short is the tone. The soul of the series feels like it was ripped away, leaving a zombie of a game to shamble across the earth. So much of this game feels like a knockoff, like the developers at 9A9 just flat out missed the point. 
It almost feels like they expected exclusively children to play this game. For instance, look at Santa's workshop level. Why? Why is this here? There is something truly abrasive about the way this game portrays itself. Instead of the stylistic comic book endings for the characters, our eyes are tortured by these bright and tacky fully animated scenes that seem designed to spook children into brushing their teeth before bed. So sweet tooth, your wish is to eat all the candy and ice cream you want? Your wish is granted. You should have brushed between snacks. I am Calypso, and I thank you for playing Twisted Metal. I mean, look at Thumper. All he wants to do is hang out with his friends, and how is he rewarded? Hang in there, kid. There's always next year's Twisted Metal competition. A pun. A pun. Oh, what have they done to my beautiful boy? All of these endings are on the same level, mostly resulting in a dumb punchline. Mr. Grimm, one of the original drivers through the whole series who hunted Calypso to steal his soul in the first game, is back in 3 with the same goal. So when he wins, he gets Calypso's soul. <laughs> oh goodness, Calypso really got him this time. Isn't that goofy and fun? I hate this. It reeks of a game that doesn't understand the source material and takes creative liberties that were never going to pan out. In the eyes of David Jaffe and most Twisted Metal fans, this game is considered non-canon because the timelines of 2 and 3 don't mesh with an inconsistent amount of time passing for individual characters. But I had sort of moved on, you know, so it didn't really bother me. It only bothered me once the games came out. You have to sort of understand the world of Twisted Metal to make a Twisted Metal game, and I think what those guys got was they understood they understood it sort of at a marketing level. Ah, oh, Twisted Metal's cool, and the characters are dark, and they're wacky, and but it, it was done like a 40-year-old trying to be cool versus actually somebody who got the world and loved the world and respected the world. It felt more like they were trying to sort of they, they were like posing, basically, and I think it really comes through in every aspect of those games. Also, apparently Axel couldn't wait to get back into his own nightmare. He's back, too. I'm, look, I'm being very hard on this game. It's just seeing how they handle these characters and viewing these corny and bad endgame cutscenes that were supposed to be your reward, it's insulting to our intelligence. But get this, in spite of the polarizing reviews, Twists of Metal 3 sold over a million copies qualifying it for the greatest hits distinction. Now, I have no proof, but I feel like that was off the series recognition alone. I'm really trying hard to separate my biases and love for Twisted Metal 2 with how I view this game, and I have come to the conclusion that you will either like it or hate it, depending on what you come to Twisted Metal for. If you've played the first two games and have exhausted yourself in the levels and vehicles, I think this game offers enough gameplay in a competent, albeit worse, way that you'll like the new levels, even Santa's workshop. There are enough new faces and returning drivers to keep you busy for a while. If you can look past the regeneration, the easily flipped cars, and the horrendous edge detection. However, if you care about the characters, their motivations, and their wishes Calypso grants, you better pass on this entry. At best you'll be disinterested, and at worst you'll be aggravated and annoyed. What. The. Hell. At some point when you've realized you've run out of ideas, it's time to call it quits. It's okay, it happens to the best of us. I've thrown out video ideas that didn't work. But 989 Studios decided, probably because of Sony putting pressure on them as an internal studio, to come back for one last ride. Of course, they probably didn't realize it was their last ride, but nevertheless, it was. So you can probably tell what I think of Twisted Metal 4 based off of those words alone, but in case it's still a bit jumbled, I want to be clear. Twisted Metal 4, in my opinion, is the worst game in the series. At its core lies a good concept, but in execution the game falls flat in every aspect.
there's a reason I started glossing over the story of the games. In the first three entries, they all follow the same story. Winner of the contest gets a wish from Calypso. It usually goes poorly for them. No more. In Twisted Metal 4, Sweet Tooth gives Calypso the boot and claims the throne for himself. Again, interesting concept. I'm with you. But here's where it loses me. Baby Sweet Tooth envies the power of the drivers who drive in the tournament and grows up to participate in Twisted Metal. But he gets tired of winning every year. Also, he inexplicably has an army of tiny clowns who do all his work for him for some reason. But as a result of this bad story, you can play as Calypso for the very first time. He drives a fire truck. He is also one of the many new drivers that make their first appearance in Twisted Metal 4. In fact, only two drivers return from previous entries. Mr. Grimm, who is a pirate now, God knows why, but good for him, and also returning is Warthog. The rest of the cast is entirely new. You have a pizza boy who drives a hatchback, and the Joneses, a family who you should be keeping up with who drives the car from the first vacation movie. I like to think it's the Griswolds in disguise, and Clark has a bad case of the road rages because Wally World was closed. There's also a trash man in his trash van doing whatever trash can. Oh, and Rob Zombie playing himself. For the first time ever, you can also create your own vehicles using a bunch of pre-made bodies, car sizes, and special weapons. The most I can say about that is, okay. It's pretty limited, and there isn't a special ending cinematic for winning as it just shares the boss character and screens. You can, however, use some online guides to recreate some classic vehicles from the series that aren't in this game using walkthroughs online. So it's fine, it's just a bit bland. I think what struck me most about Twisted Metal 4 was the lack of cohesion between levels, further building on the issue I had with Twisted Metal 3's North Pole. In Twisted Metal 1, the stage was Los Angeles, and everything was centered around the cold city. Twisted Metal 2 took place all over the world, and 3 mostly kept that idea going with some weird outliers. In 4, there is a construction yard, a city, and an absolutely miserable labyrinth of freeways. Sounds meh, but I'm not done. Next, you time travel to the year 3000 BC, and then are shrunken down to miniature size and battle in a child's bedroom. The construction level is fine, and the Neon City is alright. It has multiple levels and makes you jump across rooftops to get items. These levels also introduce environmental attacks and hazards. You can commandeer a magnet and drop opponents into a furnace in the construction yard. I like that, it was a nice little extra touch, honestly. But what annoyed me most was the lack of consistency between these levels, and I think I can adequately explain this while being irrationally mad at this bedroom level. First off, why are these cars small in the first place? Secondly, why is it covered in Twisted Metal merchandise? Who is creating table lamps memorializing this yearly event that leaves many landmarks destroyed and many people involuntarily dead? I'm not exactly rushing out to get a limited edition plate that celebrates the gender reveal that inevitably ends in a wildfire every single year. Maybe I'll bust out the COVID rocks my socks shirt next. What frustrates me even more is how weak most of the weapons feel. Their range has been dialed back significantly, so long-range weapons like Napalm just kinda dribble out. It feels awful, and the physics have somehow doubled down on being terrible. You can flip over faster, but check out this infinite wheelie. Pretty sick, huh? This is literally the most fun I had with Twisted Metal 4. That's not a compliment. Also, I never expect a save system to be worse than a password, but here we are. This is the first game in the series that allows you to save, and it's worthless because if you save after losing a life, that life is permanently gone. So you either load earlier saves to get lives back and then try to get back to where you were, or you keep dying and having to retry from the beginning anyway. It's especially miserable because there is a boss fight after every single level. Every. Single. One. At that point, it's not surprising or exciting. They are a chore. Almost all of them are returning contestants from previous games. I can't tell if it's supposed to be a throwback or if they were simply out of ideas. You can enter codes to unlock these vehicles or unlock them through playing the game. However, every boss vehicle shares the same end game cinematic, which makes me wonder, what's the point? Sure, there were fewer unlockables and hidden cars in the other entries, but at least they have unique stories attached to them. I think expectation killed me here. After reading think piece after think piece and review after review about how 3 was the worst and how 4 was a vast improvement, I think I've grown to hate this game top to bottom. It feels horrible. The tone lacks any understanding of the games that came before it, and playing and fighting boss fight after boss fight is overwhelming. 
This game came out one calendar year after 3 released, and it feels like it. The refined physics are one thing, but the rest of the game feels like everything on the cutting room floor was picked up, glued together, and rushed out to meet the deadline. It's bad. And if you have fond memories of playing this with your friends, I'm sorry. But from a single player perspective, this game is not only the worst Twisted Metal, but one of the worst games I've played this calendar year. And that really hurts to say, because it means now we're ending the inaugural Twisted Metal Month on a low note. But sometimes that's just how it goes. Sometimes you have to fall into the pit of despair to hit rock bottom before you bounce back and see how far you can rebound. We finished our first chapter on the Twisted Metal series, covering the first four games, and I'm excited to say that next year will be more positive as we cover a spin-off title, the return of David Jaffe, and the newly formed Incognito Studio, the true sequel to Twisted Metal 2, and the first and last HD entry in the series. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I hope you look forward to it as much as I am. Whoa, you really made it this far. Thanks so much for watching. Twisted Metal Month was something I've wanted to do for a really long time, like since I started this channel. So the fact that it actually came to fruition in a way that I'm happy with and it seems like people are enjoying, it, it just means so much to me. So I really thank you so much for watching this and making it this far. Uh, I, I really couldn't be doing this without all of the support that I get pretty much every single day on YouTube. It, it means the world to me. I wouldn't say this is the most difficult project that I've worked on. I'd say that's probably the... Uh, my life in wrestling video, but it was much harder to track down copies of these four games than I ever expected, especially with how well they sold. Uh, they're starting to get kind of pricey, so being able to find them at a price that was okay with my budget, especially during the uh, the last year everybody's had, um, was really lucky. Um, and I got really excited. I kind of had to Frankenstein um, boxes and discs and manuals together to finally have like a complete set. But I mean, it was it was so fun. Like the hunt was a lot of fun. I really hope how much I love the series came across, uh, even though three and four kind of caught me on a bad day, I think. Um, not that those games are great on a good day, especially four uh, being what it is, but with a series to go through the changes it did with the the original creators leaving and having to pick up the pieces through another studio, like an internal Sony studio, has always been really interesting to me, and I wanted to dive into that a little bit. Uh, there isn't that much history on the um, third and fourth entries because it's all protected Sony in, insider stuff, so it's it, it's a little bit um, it's a little bit tough to dig up, whereas. When Single Track was making these games, they were much more open about it. Uh, so, so that was an interesting aspect of it as well. Anyway, I feel like I'm rambling. I'm off script now. Uh, so, again, thank you so much for making it all the way through the end of this video. If you liked it, please consider leaving a like on it. It would really help me out a lot. Uh, if you want to see what else I do in the future, hit subscribe, hit the notifications to make sure you're never missing an upload. And if you played Twisted Metal or you never heard of it, are you more likely to play it now that you've seen this video? Uh, if you did play it, do you miss this series? Is it something you wish would come back? Let me know in the comments. Uh, I'd love to talk about Twisted Metal. I love Twisted Metal. No one talks about it anymore. So I feel like this was kind of a rogue project I did that only matters to me. Before I leave, I do want to thank Sparky Games for making the amazing intro. Uh, he had to dig up the PS1 uh, like 3D models to make that happen, and he even snuck in. And this is a little bit of an Easter egg if you made it this far into this video. Uh, he snuck in an original designed car that would totally fit in the Twisted Metal universe. It's like a Mad Max style uh, slash batman's tumbler kind of thing it looked really cool he was like i kind of snuck that in i don't know if you're okay with it and i was like yes i'm absolutely okay with it uh if you want to see more of his animation he's done a lot of work on youtube and he's a professional animator now so uh it, it's really cool uh, i'll link his channel in the description below and of course, it wouldn't be possible to track down and buy all these games without my patrons. So right now, I want to thank my higher tier patrons, Andrew Elmore, Andrew Lang, Just Jessica, Okayla, and 8-Bit Jesus. Uh, thank you all again so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. And then next year for Twisted Metal Month 2022.